Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation, and I'd like to welcome you from wherever you may be watching. Transforming the way that the festival is delivered, from live appearances to an online version, and offering an even stronger, more diverse and plentiful series of events, is a reflection of our belief that literature and the arts provide a catalyst for dialogue, creativity, empathy, laughter and tears, binding communities together. We're enormously grateful to all our speakers who've dedicated their time and talents to the festival. Please buy their books as a way of enhancing the festival experience. It's my pleasure to invite you, on behalf of my colleagues and board, as well as myself, to join the conversation. We hope that you'll do so in person next November, if at all possible. Charleston in South Carolina is a beautiful, historic and hospitable town, and the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival will definitely be going from strength to strength. I'm Suzanne Pollack, Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. This year, more than ever, we are so grateful to our generous donors, returning and new, who've made it possible to offer free sessions to everyone everywhere, building a truly international audience. There's still time for you to become a donor. We're taking donations throughout the month of November. So if you would like to become a sponsor, and we urge you to do so, please contact me using my email on the website. Thank you. Hi, I'm Suzanne Pollack, Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. I'm sitting in the beautiful library on the fourth floor of 20 South Battery Inn in downtown Charleston. Anne Applebaum and Elif Shafak are expert commentators on historic and current social divisions and conflicting interpretations of democracy, hot topics all over the world. Anne Applebaum's books include the Pulitzer Prize winning Gulag, A History, Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 to 1956, and Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine. Anne is a columnist for The Atlantic and a senior fellow of the Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. She lives in Britain, Poland, and America. Elif Shafak is an award-winning British, Turkish writer, storyteller, academic, public speaker, and activist. Her most recent novel is 10 minutes, 38 seconds in this strange world. She is a passionate advocate for the freedom of speech, a twice global TED speaker who received a standing ovation and her current book is How to Stay Sane in the Age of Division. Welcome to Anne Applebaum and Alicia Fox session. Charleston, to Charleston Literary Festival based in South Carolina. Uh, I know we have a very international digital audience right now, and we're also looking forward to receiving questions from you towards the end of our session. It gives me immense pleasure to talk to um, a, a historian, a Pulitzer winning historian, a journalist I've been following for a very long time, and a public intellectual, Anne Applebaum. Uh, and it's very nice to see you. We will be talking about Anne's recent book, which couldn't be more timely, which couldn't be more universal, Twilight of Democracy. Uh, there's so much in this book that I feel that resonates deeply with me as, as a writer, as a novelist coming from a country like Turkey. And if I may, Anne, I want to start with that feeling. I remember in 2017, there was a Freedom House report published and it said, um, all across the world, 35 countries had been making progress, which sounded like good news, but the very next paragraph within the same report underlined that 72 countries across the world had been sliding backwards, going backwards in a surprising way. So shall we start with that, with what's happening, the rise of this tribalism, this populism, nativism. There are, of course, differences as you move from one country to another, 
but there are also patterns that you have been decoding so eloquently for such a long time. Shall we start with that? And, and also maybe underline the fact that unlike what people assumed, especially in late 1990s, early 2000s, um, history doesn't always necessarily go forward in a linear progressive way. And sometimes people do go backwards. Countries can make the same mistakes that their great grandparents had made. Shall we talk about this circular notion of time and history as well? Sure, so thank you, Elif. Um, I've been a reader of yours for many years and I hope that we'll get around to saying a few words about your book, How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division, which is so parallel to mine. I mean, it's written in your style and in a, with a different sensibility, but um, we really hit some of the same issues. So, um, so it, was a, it, was a, it was a pleasure to read. Um, you know, really the reason I wrote my book was because so many things have been happening over the last four and five years that gave me a sense of deja vu, you know, things that I'd read about in history books. I, you know, as, as, as you know, and as some of the audience know, I spent um, a couple of decades writing books about the history of communism, um, about Stalinism, about the Stalinization of Eastern Europe after the war. And in the course of that, one of the things that I had to confront was what is the appeal of the authoritarian state? Um, not just, you know, we're all, we all, all of us who are brought up in democracies think automatically that, you know, dictatorship is bad and so on, but we've, we've forgot that there is also an appeal or a draw of a, of one man rule, um, of, of a, of a public sphere with no noise in it and no conflict. Um, and I'd written about that appeal or that draw in my historical work. And in about 2014 and 2015, um, I began to see it reemerging in, well, in, in, in several places, in several democracies. Um, as, as, as you know, and as some of, some of the readers know, I, I'm, I'm writing, right now I'm in Poland, um, but I am American. I spent a lot of time in Britain. Um, I, I travel a lot in Europe. Um, I've even been to Turkey. And watching the, you know, the return of certain kinds of language and certain kinds of ideas, you know, in, in Poland, in the United States, in Turkey, in the Philippines, um, in Russia, in many parts of the world, um, you know, reminded me that, you know, history, as you say, history doesn't go in a straight line. Um, it's, it's very often circular. Um, one of the ironies, I think, and this is particularly important for Americans to understand, is that actually, our political system, our constitution was created by people who knew that. In other words, it's a political system created for imperfect people. Um, one of the reasons it has so many checks and balances and so many um, oddities and, and, and you know, one of the reasons it's designed to prevent um, anyone from having too much power is that the, the people who designed it were reading the history of Greece and Rome. Um, they were thinking about Cicero um, they were thinking about Cato, um, and they were then, and they were trying to create a system which would somehow push back against the the, the inevitable rise of of a demagogue. Um, there's a, you know, Alexander Hamilton, you know, has a has a famous quote in which he says, you know, one of these days, a, a, a demagogue will arise promising people things, and and they'll believe him. So how do we create a a system that pushes back? That pushes back against us. Um, but I think because we were all so lucky over the last several decades, particularly since the end of the Cold War, we forgot, especially Americans forgot, that that urge to vote for a demagogue and the desire for simple answers and the, and the you know, this appeal of a, of a, of a one-party state, um, it's, you know, has, has always been with us. It's just that now in the current circumstances, um, it's really returned. Absolutely. And, and one of the many strengths of your book is the way you bring the East and the West together. And I, and I want to emphasize this because there was until, this, until recently a, a perception that these things happened only elsewhere, only in the East, that in those lands over there, people had to worry about women's rights and rule of law and freedom of speech. I think for a long time, this perception of the world as if it was divided into solid lands versus liquid lands. I, I remember uh, an American scholar actually telling me years ago when I used to live in Istanbul with good intentions that it was very understandable for me to be a feminist because after all I was living in Turkey. 
And I never understood why she wasn't a feminist. She was living in America, you know, because patriarchy is universal, but people tended to think that they didn't have to worry about the future of democracy in the Western world. And as you put it out so strongly in the book, especially after 2016, we now know that we're all living in a, in a very liquid world. What you do on top of that is, however, you bring personal stories, anecdotes, the art of storytelling together with political analysis, sociological analysis. And I love that element in the book. It means a lot, I think, at this stage because Politics is affecting friendships. It's affecting our family dinners, family unions. It is creating fractures, emotional fractures in the midst of our daily lives. So shall we talk about that and this amazing party that you had uh, at a very historic moment in Poland when, when Poland was on the cusp of joining the West. Uh, what happened, the people who came to that party and the party afterwards. I wanna talk a little bit about friendships and families and, and the role of politics. So this is really the starting point of my book. Um, the starting point was me in around the year 2018, trying to make sense of what had happened in the last couple of decades. And I, was a, and I had a conversation with a friend in which I described a New Year's Eve party that I'd given in 1999 on the millennium. Um, the party was actually in this house the, where, I'm, where I am today. This is a this is a house that my husband and I bought when it was a ruin. I mean, the roof had caved in. There was no, um, you know, it, it was uninhabitable. And it, we rebuilt it over a, about 15 years. Um, and in 1999, it was just about finished. Um, actually, there wasn't much furniture in it. Um, the furniture you see behind me, a lot of it wasn't there. Um, it was much more primitive. Um, but we gave the party as a way of kind of celebrating the rebuilding of the house and really the rebuilding of the country. Um, this was a very, very optimistic moment. You know, the early 90s were confusing in Eastern Europe. Um, wasn't clear which way things were going to go, but really by the end of the decade, it really felt like Poland was going to join the West. Poland was on the really clear path to democracy. Um, and most of the people who came to the party shared that feeling. And they were mostly Polish. There were some friends who came from the US and Germany and England, um, but everybody, it felt like we were all on one team and we all agreed about the way that things were going and Poland would be integrated and it would be a liberal democracy um, and it would be part of the transatlantic alliance um, and, that, and that was the way it was going and people felt happy you know, about that or, or I assumed that they did. Um, a couple of decades later, uh, that same group of people, including some of the people who were at the party, are now find themselves on opposite sides of a really profound polarizing political division. Um, so, so if you could have described my party guests in 1999 as kind of center-right, which is what they were, kind of, in Polish there's a word prawica, um, that group has now split into, uh, you know, a group that is still you would still call them center-right, or sometimes now you might call them center-left. Um, and another group, which is now much more radical, a really, a really radical right group, which is now, and some of the people who were there are now spokesmen for and journalists affiliated with and sort of thinkers affiliated with the current Polish ruling party, which is, has a very different vision of the world. It's one that is nationalist. It's one that is um, anti-integrationist, um, because the European Union is so popular here, they haven't openly come out against it, but that, that's, that's what some of their language suggests. Um, it's, a, it's a political party that is traditionalist and Catholic in a way that even most Poles weren't 10 years ago. So very fundamentalist um, and very judgmental about, uh, you know, uh, you know, about the country. And above all, it's a party that is populist in the sense of um, it's a party that defines itself as patriotic. So we are the true patriots and everybody else are foreigners, elites, outsiders, undeserving traitors. You know, so this is a, the political division in the country is now between the, this party that thinks of itself as the only righteous patriotic party, you know, and, and the sort of still liberal, you know, there's still, there's still a kind of center right, center left, and even a, a kind of even somewhat further left groupings on the other side. Um, and the question in my, the, the starting point for the book was how did that happen? 
and what was the journey of some of the people who I knew. Not all of them were close friends, but they were, they were people I knew well enough to invite to my house for a New Year's Eve party. What was their journey? What, what changed them? How did they change directions? And the book is an extended answer to that question. Um, and there isn't one answer. There isn't a kind of pat, you know, kind of one explanation. So I, I go through the biographies of different kinds of people, one or two in Poland, one or two in Hungary, um, one or two in Britain, and one or two in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And I look at the 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 impulses and that that in, that sort of propelled them away from an inter kind of internationalist, integrationist, and democratic vision of the world, and towards the idea that what you know of a of a of, a, of an undemocratic one party state. Mm -hmm. And you, you know we can we can talk in some detail if you want about some of the people, but the overwhelmingly the thing that links them, and this is across countries, and maybe if you know Turks who you could you, you could talk about in the same in the same yeah. vein, overwhelmingly what links them is a sense of disappointment. Um, sometimes it's a kind of social disappointment. They don't like the societies that they live in. They find them degenerate or insufficiently patriotic or insufficiently ideological. Um, and they feel some sense of disappointment. And in, in the case of the US, the, the person who I, I write about is the Fox News presenter, Laura Ingram, who I also knew slightly in the past, who also who feels disappointed with the diversity of modern America, which is an, an demographic change that she feels nobody ever approved of. Um, and this sense of disappointment has become very radical. So it's not just, you know, I wish some things would change. It's a sense that the society is, is, has gone wrong, it's degenerate, it must be smashed up, it must be changed completely. Um, and that impulse, that's of course the impulse towards radicalism, either left-wing radicalism or right-wing radicalism. In my case, I'm writing about, about the right, but of course I, you know, I'm a historian of communism, I know it can exist on the left as well. Um, but there's an impulse to smash things up, to destroy them, um, and to then replace them with something else. And the you know, very often, one of, the, one of the ideas I tried to get across was that sometimes the disappointment with society is also personal. So people are disappointed with their careers or they, in, you know, in the case of one of the, the polls who I, who I profile, you know, they feel they should, have, they should have got more out of the, you know, out of the, out of the transformation of Poland, that they should have been, you know, he, you know, I should have been prime minister by now, or I should have, I should be appreciated more by this society. Yeah. So in some cases, there's this personal element as well. Um, but this this change did rupture a lot of you know friendships and relationships and contacts um, that I that I had had and in some ways it's still happening. Um, you know there was the 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 election in the United States was also a very emotional yeah. period um, and there are people who who had you know radically you know different reactions to what was what's been happening there too and there are. You know, and I think it, 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 I mean, almost everybody I know has a friend or a relative um, who they now find to be on the other side of some kind of deep chasm, um, who's, cro you know, who's crossed into, some, into some, some other version of reality in which, you know, in which, you know, society is terrible, it needs to be crushed, it needs to be destroyed, and something different, um, often something older, needs to be put in its place. Uh, indeed, and, and oftentimes this perception that the present moment is so terrible is accompanied by a romanticized version of history. One of the strongest chapters in your book is actually dedicated to nostalgia. And again, that to me was of big, big interest. I come from a country that has a very long and rich history, but that doesn't mean we have a strong memory. And I think in Turkey, we're a society of collective amnesia. There are so many ruptures in terms of our connection with the past. And those voids, those gaps are usually filled in with ultranationalist or Islamist interpretations of the past. So what we learn at school is we were a mighty empire, wherever we went, we brought justice and civilization. This top-down you know, interpretation of history, single narrative. And it's, I think every nation state has its own single narrative, but in a democracy, you can find other versions, other stories, and, and the authors of those books are not incarcerated. But what we see more and more is the single narratives becoming dominant. 
and this nostalgia of a past that never was. And in the book, you mentioned the Russian artist and essay Svetlana Voin. Uh, and, and based on, on that analysis, you make a distinction between reflective nostalgia and restorative nostalgia. Can you talk a little bit about nostalgia? Because I think it's so important and says so much about what's happening in so many countries today. Yes, you know, Elif, it was your novels and, and, and other things I've heard you say that, that really explained a lot about Turkey for me. And this, as you said, this missing history. Um, and I know that you often try and put nuance back into Turkish history through the characters you choose um, and so on. So I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. But yes, in, in the book, I try and I, I talk about this nostalgia for the past. And I, I use a, a, a famous Russian essay um, to, to explain it. And the argument is that there are different kinds of nostalgia. And there can be a kind of reflective nostalgia, meaning, you know, and this is something I have actually, which, you know, which is meaning you like old things and old buildings um, and old churches. Um, and you're interested in looking at the past and thinking and trying to understand what it was. And you like old photo albums and you like reading history. Um, and you're attracted to thinking about the past and trying to imagine what it would be like. I mean, I. Um, I've lived on and off in London for many years, and um, you know, one of the one of the one of the charms of London is that you there are so many wonderful books about London. You know, with not just Dickens, but so many more, and there's so many. You know, it's such a pleasure to come to a site in the city of London and say, "Wait, I know where I am," because I read it described in a novel, um, and that feeling of of being connected to the past um, is so powerful. But there is also another kind of nostalgia. Um, which, as you say, is the basis for a lot of nationalist projects. And this is the this is a restorative nostalgia. So in other words, not just I think about the past, I miss elements of the past, um, I admire things about the past, but rather I want the past back as it was exactly as I think it was. Um, you know, I want it, you know, imp I want the rules of the past and the and the, you know, to be reimposed on the present. Um, and this is, you know, this is the vision that, for example, the Polish ruling party has here today, which is that we should, um, you know, Poles should abide by um, a form of religiosity that actually hasn't really existed in this country for many, many decades. Um, or it's, the, of course, it's what lies behind the Make America Great slogan in the United States, which was, again, really about some kind of vision of America in the 1950s that leaves out you know, the discrimination against black Americans and um, the secondary role of women and imagines that we can somehow rebuild things as they were in that imaginary suburban landscape um, and, and somehow do away with, you know, by ignoring or through violence or through something, just simply vanish the things that we don't like about the present. Um, and this element, this restorative net nostalgia, you'll find in almost any um, any dictatorship that you look at today, I mean, you can, you can, you've just described it in Turkey. Um, you can see it in Russia. Um, um, one of the things that was a really important turning point in, in, in Putinism in, in sort of modern Russia's change from, you know, it's sort of abandonment of any aspirations to being, a, you know, a liberal or a liberal democratic society was the moment when Putin resurrected the, the Soviet style military parades, um, May Day, so the, the, the anniversary of the end of the war parades, bringing back people, you know, people wearing Soviet era uniforms with, you know, guns and tanks and so on. In other words, trying to recreate this victory of 1945 for a modern audience. Um, and the, the implication is that I will bring back this victory, I will bring back this feeling of, of, of nostalgia, and, you know, we will once again be an empire. And that's, that, that impulse really does lie behind almost every autocratic project um, you know, that, that you want to name. Also, if we believe in this romanticized version of the past, we have to find who is culpable, who is, what is the reason for where we are right now. It opens the path, it paves the way for conspiracy theories, for a very divisive language um, to me, it was, it was very interesting to observe the changes the political, in the language of politics here in the UK. When I first moved here about 12 years ago, I used to think, you know, British people are so calm when they talk politics. It's amazing. And I no longer feel that way because uh, the language has changed and somehow now opponents are treated as if they're enemies. 
uh, we have been, you know, we have, we have a prime minister who uses words like surrender. So I'm very interested in how words uh, are being used, how conspiracy theories can also find the ground, misinformation can circulate, how we point fingers at each other. It was unthinkable for me to see newspapers, tabloids in the UK with front page, uh, with the pictures of judges saying enemies of the people, that term itself, enemy of the people, you know, pointing fingers at, at the media or the judiciary and calling them enemies of the people. All of that we've seen in other countries, uh, case after case. So I would love for you to tell us more about how do we deal with misinformation, the changes, the deterioration in, in the language of politics, and where do you think is the threshold? At what moments do you think, okay, this is when things start getting more dangerous? So you're absolutely right that there's a connection between this, these extreme forms of restorative nostalgia and conspiracy theories. Because, you know, if the nation has degenerated and if we are not what we used to be, you know, if we have experienced some kind of loss, then there has to be an explanation. So who is responsible for this? Um, and, you know, invariably, you know, one after the next after the next uh, would be dictators, but also just would be politicians come up with, you know, ex you know with, with explanations that are very often um, based on this kind of conspiratorial um, thinking. I mean, one of the things that has changed in the 21st century that's different from the 20th is that in the 20th century, we had these kinds of conspiracy theories attached to these huge ideologies, you know, whether it was national socialism or Soviet communism, you know, you had to believe in this whole, you know, in, in elaborate, you know, elaborate forms of philosophy and, and comp, you know, whole entire depictions of society um, in order to, to go along with this authoritarian narrative. Um, nowadays, you don't have to believe in all that. I mean, it turns out that simply one element of a conspiracy theory by itself is very is often enough of a description of the world to change people's minds about 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 their societies and so so there are two examples i talk about in the book i mean one is the one that will be most familiar to americans which was the way that donald trump used birtherism as his entry into us politics um, and if you think about what birtherism was, you know, it was this argument that Barack Obama was really born outside the United States. He was born in Kenya and therefore he was an illegitimate president. If you think about what that entailed, that meant that if, I mean, if he was illegitimate, that means that, you know, Congress and the White House and the judiciary and the FBI and the CIA and the media are all lying. You know, they're covering up the fact that we have an illegitimate president who shouldn't really be president. Um, and an amazingly large number of Americans believe that it's something like, depending on what kind of polling you're looking at, it was between 25 and 30%. And so that meant that 30% of the country was prepared to believe that all of the institutions were lying and that everything was, was, you know, was, should be doubted. Um, and this wasn't a unique, um, this wasn't unique in, in world politics at that moment. The other, the other story I tell in the book is what happened in this country, in Poland, after a uh, horrible, hor terrible plane crash that took place in 2010 that killed the president of Poland. Um, and it's a, I explain in the book, the crash was a, was a pilot error. It was caused by also by the fact that the president was very anxious to land and you know, the, the, he put pressure on the pilots to make them land in an in a, in a area with dense fog. Um, uh, he, he was going to launch his presidential campaign at a, at, a, at a war memorial and it was a strange airport and so on. But the point is that afterwards, um, his twin brother, who was the leader of his political party, turned this event also into one of these conspiracies. There had been a cover up that the maybe the opposition, what's now the opposition party was responsible. Maybe the Russians were responsible. And he spun this narrative, repeating it over and over again. And once again, if you think that the president of your country has been murdered, you know, and it's covered up by all the institutions, um, then that means your sense of trust and faith in the system and in the institutions um, is, is profoundly weakened. I mean, the UK is a special case. It's a, it's a little bit different because Brexit wasn't a theory of everything. It really was about the European Union. 
But it, there was an element of this as well in the, in the language that was used about the EU, you know, that what's wrong with our country? Why have we fallen behind? You know, why aren't we, why isn't England as important and great as it once was? It's because of the European Union. And a lot of, you know, all kinds of, you know, things that had nothing to do with the European Union were very often blamed on it. Um, and, and it became, and, this, and the structure of thinking about it really was quite similar. Again, you know, all these, you know, the main institutions of the country, as you say, the judges, the, the courts, the media, they're all supporting this evil set of institutions which are undermining our vitality and our strength. Um, and therefore, you know, we, we lose faith in them. And this use of this um, conspiratorial language, you know, based on conspiracy theory and based on um, disinformation, it turns out to be extremely powerful. Um, and, um, you know, the question then is why? And there, you know, there are a number of answers, some of which I talk about in the book, and there are some economic answers, and there are some political answers. And there's one part of the answer that I know you agree with, because it's in, it's in your book as well, which is that one of the ways in which all of our societies have changed, and this, by the way, explains why this is happening everywhere simultaneously, um, is that we now all get our information in different ways. Um, we get it from 24-hour um, news, we get it from the internet, we get it from social media. Um, and in this world of information, you know, where we all, we all, each one of us looks at our telephone and sees, I don't know, an advertisement for hairspray, a message from our uncle, news about a war in Nagorno-Karabakh, um, information about the U.S. election, then the hierarchies of value and of truthfulness have begun to disappear. And people mm -hmm. simply doubt much more of what they're heard, what the, of what they used to hear than, than, than they did before. Um, and also the ease with which you can now construct alternative realities and then live in them, um, mm -hmm. you know, is, is, is just incomparably easier than it was probably ever before in history. And so the, the you know, I, it's just not an accident that the, the, the language of friends and enemies and the language of, um, you know, good patriots versus evil conspirators, it's not an accident that this kind of language is appearing in so many different countries um, at the same time, you know, right now. Absolutely. Uh, I want to come back to what you said. It's, um, you will re remember, of course, the, the, the moment of the party, this New Year's Eve party that you're describing, uh, is also the moment of optimism, extreme optimism in the world. And back then, the biggest optimists were actually tech optimists. And they, they had, there was this faith that thanks to digital technologies, every part of the world was going to become a democracy. Those countries that were lagging behind were going to catch up sooner or later. Because how, come, how, how could they not? if history moved in one direction. So they would catch up with the rest of the civilized world. And there was so much emphasis on information, sharing information. If you give people the right, enough information, they're gonna make the right choices. It didn't happen that way. Uh, we have way too much information, very little knowledge and even less wisdom. And that's why I find your work so important because we need to change that ratio. We definitely need less information, less time on social media, we need more investigative journalism. We need in-depth analysis like yours. We need books. And also, I believe, for wisdom, for emotional intelligence, for empathy, we need stories. We need to bring the mind and the heart together. But I really want to, you to tell us more about social media, how you see it, and digital technologies, and tech monopolies in particular, because they play such a huge role. Uh, and these epistemological tribes that we have been divided into, as you said, people get their information from different sources. When that happens, when truth disappears, when you have to convince people that climate change is real, you know, let alone taking action together, you have to convince them first, how do we move forward with this much digital technology in our political lives? So I think we all know to some extent now how social media works. In other words, that the, the, the algorithms that govern it, in other words, what determines what comes up in your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed, or, depending, or, or, or even your Google searches, um, that what determines what you see are algorithms that are, that are trained to show you what, what they think you already want to see. In other words, um, if you're interested in a certain kind of you know, pop music, you know, you will see more and more 
of that. You know, if you're interested in a certain kind of, you know, lipstick, you know, I don't know, you'll see more and more of that. Um, if you're interested in a certain kind of politics, you will also see more and more of that. Um, and so you will hear over and over and over again messages from your party. You will be you will be directed to other messages. Um, you know you will be you will be immediately put into a world where you are hearing constantly repeated um, you know themes over and over and over again that convince you you know designed to convince you that that you belong in one polit political category not in another. Um, and what gets lost, of course, in this division of people into silos or, or filter bubbles um, or echo chambers, um, what gets lost is any sense of public space and public discourse. And you know, it's very, very hard to see how democracy can be maintained if people literally are living in alternate realities where they, you know, where it's not just their opinions that are different, it's their facts that are completely different. I mean, you know, look, we're watching this happen in real time right now as you and I are speaking um, in the United States where Joe Biden has just won the election. Um, there is no question that he's won it. Um, he, you know, and the media reporting the fact that he's won it are not making it up. It's not their bias. They're, they're, they're getting their information from state um, election officials who are telling them how many votes have been counted and so on. Um, at the same time, the president is seeking to create an alternate reality whereby he is one. Um, and, and doing so through carrying out frivolous lawsuits, through tweeting, through trying to get others to back up this idea. And there is some percentage of American society that will go on believing that, that he won, or if he doesn't remain in the presidency, that it's, you know, it was somehow stolen from him because really he won. Um, and without some, some kind of trusted intermediate space, so some kind of public sphere where a few facts are shared in common, it gets to be very hard to see how do we have a normal democratic conversation? I mean, this is about the, you know, the very fundamental question of who's, who won the presidential election um, in November. Um, let alone even, you know, the climate change is a, is a slightly more difficult question because it's something that some people can see. I think if you live in California, um, you now know uh, following the summer's fires, you know, you now know that something very dramatic is happening. But not everybody who lives in, I don't know, in northern England or, or southern France necessarily sees or feels the change in, in, in the same way. And so convincing people that something is happening and therefore something must be done about it um, becomes ever more difficult. Um, I mean, it seems to me there is a there is a there is a theoretical solution to this problem. Um, it's not an easy one, um, and it will require um, a level of you know a kind of government creativity and thinking of a kind that we just haven't seen yet regarding um, the internet and social media. Namely, you know, is there a way to regulate social media and the internet? so as to produce at least some kind of public space. Um, and usually when people talk about regulating the internet, they talk about censoring things. So whatever, Facebook taking things down or Twitter putting a little comment under the president's tweets. Um, really, we need to take a step back and think actually more fundamentally, which is what do we want a democratic internet to look like? So not just how do we censor or fix or shape what we have, you know, because we already know what an autocratic internet looks like because China has invented that. So it exists and, um, and, you know, and other autocratic leaders have, you know, have learned to control and use the internet in ways that suit them. But we haven't really had the national conversation, you know, either inside the United States or frankly in among, among other democracies about what are the, what, what fundamental changes do we want to, so that the debt, so that the internet remains it supports our democracies instead of undermining them. I mean, are there, you know, should there be other kinds of public fora? A little bit like, you know, in, the, in Britain, you have the BBC, which was created for very similar reasons, actually, um, as, a, as a public fora that would, you know, that would bring all different parts of the country together, you know, different, different social classes, but also different regions. Um, is there a form of social media that could do that? Is there a way to use the internet to have public discussion and debate online that's productive and not negative? Um, you know, are there limits to anonymity? I mean, should there be, you know, in, in fora where people are discussing politics, you know, should there be, you know, should you have to say who you are? Because, 
when people, you know, have, when someone with a mask over their face and someone who's speaking, you know, with under their own name, you know, that produces very different kinds of speech. Um, you know, should there be, you know, what if there were algorithms that favored, instead of favoring anger and emotion and excitement and the things that they, that they favor now, what if they favored productive speech and better conversation, you know, more, uh, you know, so, so those are all, you know, we're just at the really beginning of this kind of conversation. Um, and it is something that I hope to work on over the next year or so. Uh, and it's one of the real conclusions that I, you know, as I did this thinking through of what had gone wrong in Poland and in America and elsewhere, um, one of the conclusions I came to was that, you know, this, the, the, the conspiratorial thinking and these profound divisions had really destroyed something that that we need in order to, to maintain democracy. And I, I hope that the next administration at lead in the US, um, but also you know, working together with Europe um, and others begins to think through some of these problems. Mm -hmm. Before um, we have little time left, before we go open up for audience questions, I want to ask you about things that give us hope. You know, I want to talk about pessimism and optimism. And one of the things that give me a lot of hope is women's movement in Poland. I follow both the LGBTQ uh, rights movement and the women's rights, women's strike in, in Poland. And, and I find it so important because we started this debate by underlining that history doesn't always necessarily go forward. Countries can slide backwards. If and when that happens, I think when countries tumble into nationalism, some kind of religious fundamentalism, populist authoritarianism, the very first rights that will be curbed, taken away, will be women's rights and minority rights. History gives us plenty of examples to show that. So I think women need to become more concerned. Need, women need to be more active and engaged citizens defending democracy. And I always follow Poland and women's movement in Poland. Will you tell us a bit about what is happening in Poland, both in terms of women's movement, but also LGBTQ rights? You're, you're absolutely right. You know, one of the conclusions that I came to at, as I was, as I was, again, as I was writing the book, um, was that it was really unfair to be pessimistic. In other words, a lot of what I write is dark. <laughs> and a lot of things that I've worked on in my life have been negative stories, you know, the story history of the gulag or, or, of, or of, of the Ukrainian famine. Um, and I probably am naturally a pessimist. I mean, that's just how I was born. And some, you know, I, I suspect you might be too. Um, but one of the, but one of the conclusions I came to was, and this is this is something I get in particular from spending time with younger people, is that pessimism is so unfair to them. You know, because it's you know they they will inherit our world and telling them that I don't know democracy is finished and everything is over and you can't change anything. Is is you know is just immoral, um, and so I I do spend also again at the time at the end of the book looking for positive things to say. And you are absolutely right that the women's movement in Poland that has evolved over the last several years is so interesting for many reasons. One is that it involves very young women. Um, yeah. We were and and also very provincial women. Um, so I'm again I'm in my I'm in a provincial part of Poland right now and. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we went to a women's march in a very small town called Shubin, which is about a 20 minute drive from here. And it's a town of about 10 or 12,000 people. And there were, you know, on an, on an ordinary evening, there were, a, there were about 500 women, men and women actually, mostly quite young, who met in the town's small square. And then for about 40 minutes, marched around with signs, um, chanting things and, and playing music. And we were with, um, we, we, I know slightly the mayor of the town and we asked him um, whether there'd been anything like this before. And he said, no, never. I mean, not in living memory, you know, that there had been a, a political demonstration in this small town. And he said, maybe in the, you know, in the 1940s when the communists had these forced May Day parades, you know, maybe something like that. Um, but this was of course spontaneous, it didn't come from the government. Um, and I think what you're seeing in Poland in a way is um, it, you know, I hope will be the answer to the to some of the difficulties we've had here in the last few years, which is that, um, you know, democracy here arrived. I won't say it's an elite project because I hate the word elite now; it's become so meaningless. But it did it did almost get handed to people from above. You know, it was the result of the 
end of the Soviet Union. It was, um, you know, there were people at the top of the country, you know, wrote a constitution. There was a vote on the constitution and so on, but there wasn't any democratic education. Um, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a mass movement in which people talked about or argued about what kind of democracy Poland would have. And in a way, it may be that that's what's happening now. I mean, as a reaction to very harsh legal changes that will affect women's lives here, that you see people suddenly being radicalized and realizing that actually government isn't just a thing that happens somewhere else, you know, and it's some, something that experts do and politicians, you know, are specialists. And, you know, we just don't really know it. We don't worry about them. Maybe we vote every four years, but we don't have to be engaged. Suddenly you're seeing people realize, wait, this stuff affects me and it will affect my life. And you see a lot of women, a lot of younger women um, in Poland who suddenly realize that. Um, mm -hmm. And there, there have been a series of demonstrations. There's a, you know, the beginnings of, um, uh, of a real political movement. And I agree with you, absolutely. This is a really, it's a hopeful sign for that something better will emerge. Indeed, indeed. So I want to share some of the questions that came from our audience. Um, one of them goes like this. Which of the two extremes is a bigger threat to freedom and democracy? Upper left revolutionary zeal, political correctness, etc., or the casual relation to the truth on the lower right, Trumpism? I mean, I would, that's a, I would phrase the question differently because I think Trumpism is also an elite project. Um, and, and, and was conceived at a very high level. Um, so calling it somehow some kind of lower class project, I think misses something essential about it. But it's true that I, I have often been asked this question because there, there are many who fear rightly this wave of liberal thinking on the, in cultural institutions and in some cases in the media on the left in America, trying to make you know, everybody speak about you know, racial problems or um, or, or um, problems of, you know, discrimination in, in the same way, using the same language, and then seeking to kind of cancel or eliminate people who violate those rules. So there is a, um, there, you know, that is a, that is a deeply illiberal tendency, and it's, um, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a very ugly one. Um, you know, I do think, you know, I do think that, you know, one of the reasons why Joe Biden was successful. One of the reasons why the majority of his party chose him, um, and one of the reasons why he won the election, was that I think most Americans, including those on the left, you know, don't want that impulse, that that kind of canceling or um, you know, illiberal impulse running the country. Um, and you know, you know, whereas unfortunately the, you know, the illiberal impulse on the right, you know, was, you know, had a political voice in the form of Donald Trump um, and Trumpism. Um, and we're seeing it play out right now, as yeah. I say, as he refuses to leave office. So, you know, it seems to me that if, if, you know, if you're asking me to balance them out right now, and I speak again, I'm a historian of Soviet communism. <laughs> um, but right now, I am more afraid of the illiberal impulses on the right, because they have political power, because they have the commanding voice in one of our political parties um, because they have actual government influence and control. And by the way, that's true in Europe as well, where we have two political parties, one in Poland and one in Hungary that fit the same profile and a number of other parties that are out of power, but sometimes share power, influence politics in other European countries, France, Austria, um, Germany, Spain, um, and, and elsewhere. So I, because, it, because it takes a political form, that worries me more. I mean, does that mean there are no problems on the far left? No, of course not. Um, and I'm hoping one of the things I'm looking forward to, if Trump leaves, um, is, is that it will become easier and more and and more, um, you know, easier to talk about that once again and those kinds of problems once again. I should also say though that the it's often I, I also think that it's a mistake to talk about these two phenomena as if they were separate. I mean, they do interact with one another and they do encourage one another. And Leif, I know you agree with this because we were talking about it right before we started this, this conversation, um, which is that, you know, namely for the left, Trump really embodied everything that they had always said was true of America, but most people never believed, namely that, you know, he used racist language. He was, uh, 
you know, a plutocrat, he was a nepotist, he was corrupt. And he really, he, he gave a, some on the left this feeling that, you know, that they were right in disliking, in feeling the same kind of radical disappointment with the United States. I mean, and in the same way, um, the more extreme examples of the left, the, you know, the, 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 the people who topple over Abraham Lincoln statues um, in Portland have also inspired those on the right to feel that they're correct in their sweeping, you know, extreme views of the United States. I mean, it really is, um, it's my, it's, although I am now, I still remain more afraid of the right because it has such a strong political foothold. I am hopeful that actually the extremism on both sides will reduce itself um, under a Biden presidency simply because we have a moderate voice, it, you know, at the top of the, of the, of the, of the, our political structure once again. Mm -hmm. The, the next question actually follows on that because it's about whether authoritarianism is becoming more acceptable to voters in the US. So rather than what happened in these last four years with Trump and how broken are the institutions, that's how I, I interpret the, 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 the question, the future of authoritarianism or authoritarianism itself becoming more normal, acceptable, uh, routine in a way, banal in a way, you know, yeah, in America. I mean, I I think that in essence is what Trumpism is. I mean, and, and there, there's a real question as to whether there's gonna be Trumpism without Trump. I'm, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure I know what that means yet. I have to, to think about it more, but um, he, he took something that already existed, which was, a, um, which was an authoritarian tendency inside the Republican party, which had you know, manifested itself through gerrymandering, through, um, you know, through a retreat from, uh, you know, from, you know, instead of trying to win the votes of everybody, seeking to play political games in order to stay in power as a, as a, even as a minority party. Um, and he took that impulse that was there and he made it manifest and he spoke about it proudly and he, and he, you know, and he, and he encouraged it. And so I think one of the effects of the Trump presidency, unfortunately, is that, and again, you can see this right now in the number of people who, you know, are ready to believe that um, that he actually won an election that he lost, um, and that he should use some extra legal, some court means, you know, to, to to you know to changing the electoral college in order to overthrow the vote. I mean, this is you know unthinkable in American history. I mean, the only only moment you can compare it to is 1860. Um, you know, this idea that we can somehow overthrow the system, you know, using some extra legal means. Um, and so, yes, I'm afraid that the this, the impact he's made on the country is to encourage this illiberal authoritarian thinking, especially on the right. Um, and, and, and dealing with that legacy is gonna be our most important political problem for a long time. So as, as we bring it to a close, I, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the pandemic. We have not spoken about it. It is so important. And I don't know if you'd agree with me, but I think it's a moment when the existing inequalities are now exposed, have become much more visible. I find inequality, inequality is plural, uh, very important. Not a side issue, not a footnote, but I think it should be at the center of all of our debates, including racial inequalities, gender inequalities, regional inequalities. And I wonder, how do you see this moment in time, the pandemic, do you think from this crossroads onwards, we're gonna see a rise of more of this, more nationalism, whether of course Trump is, has lost the elections, but I'm not talking about individuals. Um, the, the phenomena that brought him here, are we gonna see a strengthening of this nativism, tribalism, or do you think this is, this is actually a chance for the world to realize we have massive global challenges ahead, which we can't deal with the forces of nationalism? which way are we gonna go as, as we arrive at this crossroads? So I did think at the beginning of the pandemic that this would be, as, it ha as has happened so many times before in history, that this medical crisis and the need for isolation and closed borders and so on would be an advantage for, for authoritarians and nationalists of all kinds. One of the things that we see though, as it's gone on, um, and it's, you know, and as it, it reached, what are we now, nine months, or depending on how you count, almost a year. Um, uh, one of the things that we've seen is that the solutions to the pandemic are going to be international. They're going to involve science and rational thinking. I mean, 
is, I mean, it's almost funny, the fact that the, the first vaccine that seems that, that we know works is the product of a, you know, is the brainchild of a German Turkish couple who emigrated from Turkey to Germany. Um, and it's of course a joint, you know, a joint project between a, that German company and a, an American, big American company. Um, it's been tested in countries all over the world. It has buy-in and cooperation in that, that means from medical establishments in multiple countries. Um, you know, this is a truly international project, you know, one that wouldn't have been possible without international trade, without immigration, without the, you know, without the ability to exchange ideas as we do. So it may be that as coming out of the pandemic, you know, as people realize how interconnected we all are and how all of the solutions are going to involve you know the, the 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 you know the exchange of ideas rather than the construction of borders. Um, it may be, and I, I hope this is the case. And this is where my you know my my feeling that it's you know responsibility requires being optimistic. Um, it's my hope that one of the things that comes out of the pandemic is a you know is that people become more skeptical of this you know the the kind of nationalism and that that and authoritarianism that really leads nowhere. Yeah. Sometimes I jokingly think if you open a map of Europe and you follow the blue Danube, the river Danube, with your finger, as you move from Germany towards the Black Sea, I think the level of optimism drops. So by the time <laughs> you reach Romania, Bulgaria, the Black Sea, Turkey, pessimism is easier. Optimism is much more difficult. Understandably, we have very complicated histories, but we need this faith. We need this hope. We need this optimism or we need maybe the pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the heart as, or, or the will, as Gramsci used to talk about. This has been a fascinating, com fascinating conversation. I enjoyed it so much. And I want to thank Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival for making it possible, for bringing us together. I want to thank our digital audience from all across the world, very different backgrounds and countries. But I want to thank you especially, Anne Applebaum, for bringing knowledge, for bringing wisdom, for bringing sanity, into our public spaces for giving us nuanced conversations and helping us to think forward. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you so much, Alif. Um, I'm such an admirer of yours and I really appreciated the chance to talk to you. <laughs>